Hello, everyone. Um, we are delighted today to welcome Roger Stripmatter uh, to the SOF interviews. He is a professor of humanities at Coppin State University in Maryland. Um, in 2001, uh, he received a doctoral degree from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst on Oxford's Geneva Bible, um, which contains hundreds of underlinings relating to the work of Shakespeare. If you are looking for a true um, excursion through the world of uh, literature, I'm going to recommend, if you can see this, here we go. The Marginalia of Edward de Vere's Geneva Bible, um, and the providential discovery, literary reasoning, and historical consequence. The consequence is that Oxford wrote Shakespeare. Um, he is also the author of this work uh, on uh, the date, sources, and design of Shakespeare's The Tempest, written with a colleague, Lynn Kasitsky. Um, that's published by McFarlane. I recommend it to you. Um, and he's written hundreds of articles uh, in uh, uh, various publications. He has also just finished editing and published the Shakespeare Authorship Sourcebook, a resource for educators and students. And we are going to talk about that uh, today. So Roger, thank you for joining us. Um, what's the purpose of the Authorship Sourcebook? Well, first of all, thank you for having me on the program. Um, it, it is to fulfill to fill a, a real need, uh, both for secondary school educators and for college professors, of uh, a collection of high quality essays that deal with the problem, the question of teaching the authorship question, because I maintain that uh, it is actually a separate or semi-detachable uh, sub-genre of Shakespeare scholarship as such. And normal, normally Shakespeare scholars, to say the least, have not been trained in how to deal with the authorship question. So this book provides resources both for teachers and professors, as well as students to be able to do that. Terrific. Um, how long did you work on this? Uh, probably, a, without looking at my calendar, I can't be sure, but probably about three years, four okay. years. Terrific. Um, and it's available through Amazon. Um, and uh, about, I think, $35 is the price. Uh, Correct. And that, it, that includes the fact that it has color inside. So that includes a number of quite a few pages in color, uh, which is why it even costs that much. We, we're really trying to make an effort to keep the price as reasonable as possible. Um, it's, it's well worth it. Um, and there are innumerable illustrations, both photographs um, and almost cartoons. Uh, here's one I particularly like, uh, that if you're concerned about uh, the authorship, um, I suppose I should get these mounted somewhere, but there's William, no evidence of uh, uh, that he owned books, no evidence of any real education. Um, and yet we think he is the author of all these plays. Look, at, why don't you um, walk us through some of the contents um, and, and suggest the reason why you organize this book the way you did and how that will help the educational experience? Well, let me remind myself of exactly what the sections are. <laughs> so, um, then there were some changes as we went through the editorial process with this, but we ended up with a, a short first section just called Getting Started. Mm -hmm. And that features a, a really well-written, dramatic, and educational account by Robert Barrett, who was a 
ninth grade English teacher in Silverdale, Washington, who taught for probably eight to 10 years, uh, a, a course on Shakespeare in the ninth grade that actively included the authorship question as one of the means of getting the students interested in reading the text and getting interested about these plays. Um, it's called Shakespeare Meet Robert Frost, teaching the authorship question to ninth graders in Kitsap County. Um, after that, we have sections on history, stories from the trenches, working from the text, alternative candidates, and so on and so forth. Um, Originally, Barrett's article had been included in the stories from the trenches section because that's really what it is. It's an account of the um, sometimes quite dramatic process of bringing up this topic uh, for uh, an audience that may have been uh, cultivated to disdain the subject and regard it as a conspiracy theory, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it is, the authorship question is a historical question. Mm. It's a unique historical question because it involves literary evidence to a greater degree than most historical questions do. And it also involves psychology, linguistics, uh, theater history. Uh, so it's an intrinsically interdisciplinary subject but I thought it was important to begin the book by anchoring the more recent articles in some of the history of the debate, which actually is quite interesting and goes back uh, easily to the 19th century. And actually, as Alexander Waugh has argued and other people have argued, um, really is visible in the literary record, even in the 16th century. Um, let, me, let me ask you um, a couple of things. Uh, that's, that's a terrific introduction. Um, I read and, and I really enjoyed uh, Barrett's article on his teaching experience. He unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Um, but he talks about the opposition from some of his colleagues at his school uh, to teaching this kind of thing and how he had to struggle with it in himself uh, before frankly converting uh, many of them. Right. Um, and I think to that degree, it's, it's sort of uh, inspiring. There's another question here. You mentioned, I have another question. You mentioned in part four, is titled Alternative Candidates. And we've got Francis Bacon, Marla, William Stanley, the Earl of Derby, um, and the new Oxford groupist theories. Um, the Earl of Oxford is not identified as an alternative candidate uh, here. Why is that? Well, that's because um, honestly, the entire volume does have what might you might call a pro-Oxfordian slant to it. Um, I, my personal opinion is that as a matter, as a topic in intellectual history, there has not really been an equivalent theory to the Oxfordian one since it was first articulated in 1920 by John Thomas Loney. Um, so I, I do want, I did want the book to acknowledge the existence of a multiplicity of candidates and particularly those for which uh, significant arguments can or have been advanced, I wanted to include that. So that was the basis of the selection of those others. As you know, in the 19th century, Francis Bacon was by far and away the most popular alternative candidate, um, a view that pretty much exploded itself through indiscriminate pseudo-cryptology and other forms of secret mongering. Uh, and especially after Oxford came along, uh, became no longer uh, comparatively convincing. You uh, dedicate the book to uh, Lynn Kosicki, your um, uh, colleague and co-author, uh, to Ginger Renner, 
Um, and also to Delia Bacon, about whom you say, one more sinned against than sinning. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, Delia Bacon is a remarkable figure in the history of the authorship question because she was the first American writer uh, in the 1850s to really begin to put the argument that there was a problem with the traditional biography, to put that argument forward with a a great deal of charisma and and, uh, powerful logic. Um, She was an unusual woman in an age when women were not supposed to have any public life. She spoke, she lectured publicly throughout New England on uh, many historical topics, including Shakespeare. She uh, was uh, greatly admired by just about every one of the male leaders in New England transcendentalism, uh, including Hawthorne and uh, Melville and Walt Whitman. Uh, And she had a tragic life in part due to the bullying behavior of Orthodox Shakespeareans. Uh, And to this day, they, some of them anyway, seem to enjoy pissing on her grave, uh, which is quite extraordinary in the 21st century where, you know, we are supposedly our culture is, and, and, and actually I think our culture is moving in the direction of being more appreciative of the intellectual contributions of women to uh, the life of the mind, she still is scorned and disdained and held up as a negative role model. If you do this, you will end up like Delia Bacon in an insane asylum. (laughs) Um, And I personally find that uh, it bothers me a lot. (laughs) Analogously, um, I forget the name of the researcher, but it was the uh, the scientist who developed the theory of tectonic plates. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and he was ridiculed uh, at the time. Um, and it affected him uh, very deeply. And I, he yeah. easily went into depression. And I, I don't know um, what other consequences there were for him personally. But we now accept the theory of tectonic plates and their movement right. uh, and, the, and the clash of those plates. And yet um, 50, 80 years ago, uh, he was ridiculed. So um, there, is, there is history there. Um, I, think you'll find, I think you'll find that that's a pretty common story that most, many, if not most, uh, novel breakthroughs of new knowledge paradigm shifts, if you will, they normally come with a lot of conflict and eventually a crisis in the uh, group that uh, originally held the ruling paradigm when it finally begins to break down. But in the process, a lot of damage can be done. Yeah. Um, Can you talk a bit about your chapter on critical thinking and why you included it? Yes, thank you for that question. Well, one of the reasons to teach the authorship question is that uh, doing so requires uh, using one's critical thinking skills. What we have here is a venerable tradition that has been passed down Uh, by word of mouth and by professional training for a couple of centuries now, that to many people uh, approaching it seems pretty hollow and seems to be uh, held in place merely by uh, sticks and pieces of bubble gum (laughs) that are uh, are, uh, rhetorical fallacies of one kind or another. And so there's actually been quite a bit written about this over the years. Um, the, the lead article in this section on being wrong by Michael Delahoy, who is at Washington State University, um, 
is, is in fact uh, uh, partly a book review of a book by that title that uh, Delahoyd was reading as part of his university uh, wide curriculum piece of reading. And so he applies on it, applies in this article, some of the notions from this book to the authorship question and shows pretty clearly why we need to bring critical thinking to Shakespeare studies because it's too often lacking. Um, and then, you know, there's a few other articles in there. One of the most interesting one is by Sir George Greenwood, who was during up until about 1920, right about the time that Loney published his book, Greenwood was the most influential British advocate of an alternative to the traditional view of Shakespeare, he irritated his enemies a great deal because he refused to say that he thought that Bacon had written the plays. He merely insisted that the man from Stratford had not and stated that he was not sure who had written them. In, in 1920, after Loney's book came out, he joined with Loney to form the first Shakespeare Fellowship. So I don't know if he ever openly declared that he thought Oxford was the author, but he worked closely with Oxfordians in those early days. And his article is about Ben Jonson and Shakespeare. Jonson is often claimed to be some sort of a magic bullet for the tradition. Oh, you people must answer Ben Jonson first. Well, Greenwood explores why we need to read Johnson more carefully than we have, and that it's a mistake to treat him as an unambiguous witness for the Stratfordian uh, tradition. Whatever um, academic training and skill that Johnson had, when I was looking into his biography, I was struck and how often he was in debt, uh, giving the need for money and perhaps uh, the need to shape a narrative that would fit the uh, purposes of his uh, uh, sponsors. Um, I That's know. true. That's true. <laughs> and yet, and yet Johnson was famed for his independence as well. And uh, he, he knew how to criticize uh, sponsors who he didn't approve of in ways that were nearly undetectable to them. That's a skill. Quite a feat. Yes, yeah. he was quite, he's quite a brilliant writer, quite a brilliant writer. And the other thing that really emerges with Johnson is if you compare him to Shakespeare, um, supposedly these are both middle class playwrights and they're yeah. more or less contemporaneous. Johnson lives a little bit longer and is a little bit younger, uh, but Johnson is thoroughly enmeshed in the social networks of patronage and literature in Elizabethan England. He is connected in the form of dedicatory poems that he wrote or dedicatory poems to him with literally dozens of contemporaries. Shakespeare doesn't appear on that map with the sole exception of the two dedications to the Earl of Southampton with whom he cannot in any other way be connected. So Johnson is a, is a, is a very important figure in all of this and his life forms a striking contrast which is an implicit criticism of Shakespearean orthodoxy. Uh, for you uh, uh, teachers and scholars and students out there, the chapter before is called Visual Aids and Research Tools, and it forms, it can form a, um, uh, uh, a great teaching uh, moment when you take a look at some of those things. Um, the next chapter after critical thinking is introductory Oxfordian readings. Um, and you've got a number of people uh, widely respected uh, taking a look at popular uh, Shakespeare plays. Um, William Farina on Macbeth, uh, again, uh, Farina on Julius Caesar, uh, and again on Romeo and Juliet. 
Um, what can you tell us about William Farina and the introduction to these Oxfordian readings? Yeah, let me see if I can lay my hands on this book here. Where the heck is it? Oh, my. So this is Farina's book, and I really have to give a big thank you to him for allowing us to generously to excerpt three uh, chapters. This book has one chapter on each of the 36 canonical plays and goes through that individual play, analyzing it in terms of the influences from Oxford's life. And uh, so uh, other people have done this, but Farina has done it most comprehensively. And he was very generous when we approached him to get, we wanted to get three plays that are very often taught in high school, because we do envision this as a book that um, is, is, will, should be useful both to at the high school level, maybe even down to the ninth grade, and then in college as well. So those are some of the more basic uh, readings in the book. Um, we also, uh, although it's in a, the next section, which is called the Dance of Sources and Biography, we have uh, Felicia Landre's marvelous essay on Hamlet as autobiography. So we have close readings of those four plays. Um, I, I would say that um, uh, I somewhat feel um, uh, vindicated uh, by the way you've outlined it. When I graduated from high school, um, I really loved th Shakespeare and it was a thought that I had that I would go into the field. My big problem was I didn't think that Shakespeare had written the plays. Um, and I didn't know of any of the alternative candidates at that point. Right. Um, I knew of, of Delia Bacon and, and, and I knew of um, uh, Lord Bacon and I knew of Marlowe, but their styles, their writing styles didn't seem to match up in any real way um, with what Shakespeare had produced. So I went off to college as a general English major um, and it wasn't until five or eight years after graduating that I uh, uh, learned of Oxford and started to uh, pursue that. Um, I, think, I think a lot of people have felt that way in the past, and that includes even people teaching Shakespeare, both in high school and in college. I know that Lynn Kaczynski told me that when she taught uh, Shakespeare in a junior college in Britain that she uh, she didn't teach anything about the life because it just didn't compute that it was relevant. And it's not. Is there a life? There is no life of Shakespeare. <laughs> well, <laughs> there's, you know, what we get in a normal Shakespeare biography is a, a, is a history of a man who uh, was not very responsible and was very uh, vindictive about, uh, he, he was a money lender and uh, he was quite eager always to get every last penny of his loans back. And he became pretty wealthy and he retired to Stratford-on-Avon for the last, what, uh, um, almost 10 years of his life. At the height of his powers. At the height of his creative powers and just decided to do nothing in effect. See, that's, that's the job I always wanted. I always wanted to be able to write sonnets and long poems and plays and then go back and be a grain merchant and a money lender i exactly. always thought exactly. that was a, a great career choice right um all right i, I want to look at a, at a couple of of uh, uh concluding articles um one is shakespeare and the warwickshire uh, uh dialect mm -hmm. and rosalind barber Right. Uh, I'm interested in it because I had read at one point that it was difficult for the military during the Elizabethan reign to military officers to basically talk to their troops because the dialects were so different. Um, uh, and troops from the north couldn't understand leaders from the south, etc. Uh, but what can you tell us about the dialect issue? Well, I have heard that too. And it's not an area that I have very much special okay. knowledge of. Right. 
But the reason I wanted to include this article is that it absolutely thoroughly dev in devastating detail. And I think it's probably the hardest article in the book, but it's a, a hard article that's well worth it when you see what she's doing. It just devastates the argument that there are uh, that there is Warwickshire dialect in the plays. There isn't Warwickshire dialect in the plays, except possibly in places where this multi-dialectical author decides to put it for comic purposes. Right. Um, the main dialect of the plays, the dominant dialect, is what we might call a London or Essex dialect. Mm. And the writer has a very fine oral sensibility and, of course, has a singing in Welsh and bad French and, you know, multiple modal linguistic modalities in the plays. But it is not true, Barber concludes, that there is any uh, discernible, uh, even residue of a Warwickshire dialect. I, the words that are used to claim that are either not exclusive to Warwickshire or uh, for some other reason do not lead to that conclusion. So um, this is the, the article about the same topic that I didn't include is Gary Goldstein's article uh, showing that the plays are in an Essex dialect, but there is a cross reference to that in the book. So the reader that wants to pursue looking at that uh, will know where to go. Tell us about Shakespeare and the law. Um, now, I know that you are working on a book uh, of essays, uh, which will have your introduction. Um, uh, and you quote here, uh, or you reprint here, uh, an article from Tom Renier, who was so influential um, in uh, uh, this organization. Um, and the, the title was, Could Shakespeare Think Like a Lawyer? What can you tell us about that? Well, I think the, uh, the conclusion actually of people like Tom who have looked at this question seriously is that Shakespeare thought like a Supreme Court justice. <laughs> um, it, it has, as has long been known since the 19th century, middle of the 19th century, if not before then, when the subject was first studied intensively, uh, Shakespeare has a ready fund of legal nomenclature at his hand and is in fact so much tied to the idiom of the law that it comes up repeatedly in the sonnets, which are private devotional confessional poems. Um, and he has, uh, you know, of course, both measure for measure which comes from the New Testament passage about as you as as you as you me as you measure it will be measured to you, um, and Merchant of Venice. Both of those are deeply legal plays in a very philosophical way that concern, you know, the most fundamental, not just legal language, but fundamental questions of justice. And so it's pretty clear that he's really absorbed by this. And Hamlet, as Renier and others have pointed out, is itself on one level, a kind of a dramatic study in uh, the law of inheritance. Right. The very first line of the play is who's there directed uh, at the empty air where the ghost is. If you slow that down just a little bit, it's who's the heir. Oh, and wow. That is clearly, to my way of thinking, intended because, in fact, the rest of the play is really an exploration of that problem of who is the heir. Now, we, we know that William Shakespeare, the completely uneducated um, uh, man from Stratford, um, somehow acquired a great deal of legal knowledge, including um, uh, knowledge of the case of uh, Halls v. Pettit, which I think is referenced in, in Hamlet by the Gravestiggers. Right. Um, but uh, Oxford, uh, who doesn't suffer from the, uh, the problem that Shakespeare suffers from, which is he wasn't educated, uh, Oxford attended Gray's Inn. 
Mm -hmm. um, and what interested me about the studies in Gray's Inn was that the, um, uh, the room in which they had to present their cases was a long, narrow room with benches on the side and in effect a head table up at the front, um, which is not unlike many theaters. Um, and I have always been struck by that, particularly the fact that this guy actually studied law in a formal setting. So, right. So, um, and then the other thing is... Um, I, just before you move on, just yeah. one other thought about that. You can see his interest in the law in the Bible annotations. Huh. For example, there is a passage in Samuel, I don't remember exactly where it is, where there's a footnote that um, describes that that comments about the main text and says that this that God would have this uh, be a model for magistrates and judges. Hmm. And that's underlined. Okay. The footnote is underlined. So he's thinking about what are the responsibilities of, of judges uh, as they're set forth in the Geneva Bible footnotes to the Old Testament, to the Torah. So, or not, not to the Torah, but to the historical <laughs> book. Sorry. Well, the Torah is a kind of Bible. Um, uh, so, um, uh, so you've got three appendices that I think are significant. The Shakespeare Authorship Course Syllabi, the Oxfordian uh, Chronology, and Bibliographies. I think for educators and students, these are great sources of information that can be pursued. Um, yes. Is that part of your intention? Oh, absolutely. And my main regret is that so much good stuff came out kind of while I was working on this book that I wasn't fully caught up on, that you know, now I look at the bibliographies and I think, oh, they're already out of date. But, you know, I guess that's the, you know, that, that, that's what happens when you're working yeah. in a field that is as dynamic as this one, where there's continues to be this outpouring of really great new scholarship. It's difficult to keep up with. I have always wanted to see a series of books. I always want to think big. We've got Shakespeare in the Law. I'd love to see a book on Shakespeare and medicine. Uh, since he knew there's so much medicine, accurate medicine, right. in the plays. Um, and whoop, that's the drop book syndrome. Um, I don't have enough room here. <laughs> uh, well, I'll just knock out four or five bookshelves. Uh, and you can see from where I'm talking from that I don't quite suffer from the same problem you do, but I'm at risk of that. Right. Um, uh, so Shakespeare in the Law, Shakespeare in Medicine, what other um, titles could we put together to show uh, uh, Shakespeare's knowledge of X that refers back to Oxford? Uh, Italy, uh, perhaps? Oh, yeah. And definitely, there's definitely plenty of material for one on medicine. Medicine, Italy. I mean, uh, France. Uh, I know I, Elizabeth Wagerman is working on a book now about uh, the French connection. And uh, I mean, one of the interesting, another interesting biographical fact about Edward de Vere is that by the time he was 13 years old, he was fluent in French. Yeah. And I think that he was probably a pretty important figure behind the scenes in Elizabethan uh, government affairs as a liaison to France because he was known to be a, a friend of, of Henry of Navarre who became Henry IV and so uh, yeah that would be another area um, I'm sure we could think of a lot of others if, uh, well um, I, th I think we'll have the opportunity to both think about them and to do them um, I'm going to say that um, we've run through the book I want to encourage people uh, not to take our word for it, but to buy it. The Shakespeare Authorship Sourcebook, a resource for educators and students, second edition. Um, lots and lots of stuff in here. Uh, Roger, thank you very much for joining us. Um, hope to uh, talk to you again uh, on other of your various uh, projects. 
Mm -hmm. um, and thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. Did you want to did you want to put in a membership pl plug? Oh, you're absolutely right. I had it on the other piece of paper and I just didn't do that. Yes, if you have enjoyed this talk uh, and you are not a member of the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship, please consider joining. The uh, membership dues constitutes our single largest source of un unrestricted revenue. Um, and in order to bring events like this to you um, and to support researchers like uh, Roger Stripmatter, um, we need cash. And the best way to get that is through membership. So Roger, thank you very much for, uh, for correcting me. And um, uh, one way or the other, I'd like to talk to you again. All thank right. you, Bob. Bye -bye. Take care.